Welcome to Police K9. I'm Greg Tony. With me, Rich Hartman. Rich, what's going on? Got a lot going on. We just finished a basic that was, uh, can we agree it was borderline too big? <laughs> Never. It was a lot. It Never was a lot of big. dogs, man. <laughs> <laughs> we worked our asses off on this handler class. <laughs> I never want to do lot. that again. No, man. I think uh, I, I I don't think I've seen you that stressed out at the end of several days. And I think it goes to we talk about this all the time when you're and we've both been in this situation when you're in the class and you're the one receiving the information. You really only have to pay attention to what affects you <laughs> when you're teaching the class. Man, you're a. Uh, you're organizing a, a symphony out there, man. There's so many parts and things that you have to deal with, whether it's dogs, handlers, behaviors, you know, scenarios, all the things that you're setting up and then trying to juggle that um, gets to be a lot. And we both put a lot of pressure on ourselves and the rest of the trainers that are with us to keep shit happening all the time. We hate downtime. Uh, you and I both despise it. I know Jason and Greg and those guys, Hector, they're all the same way. Everybody wants to keep everything rolling and that's not always easy. No. And I mean, we are, we hate downtime and it plagues our industry. And so we always feel that responsibility and, you know, from obedience to the end of the day, we like to get seven or eight meaningful things in with the dog, depending on what we're working. If we're working on basic skills or we're working on scenarios or we're problem solving or we're exposing the dog to different environments. And so we feel that pressure and it, uh, you know, so we don't stop. And a lot of times we work just straight through lunch or we take a 15 minute lunch and we're back at it. And um, what we do is so important. And I feel like uh, we all feel that responsibility and not to... It, I don't want to throw out like hyperbole. It's it's not, but like lives depend on the performance of these handlers and their dogs, not just their life, but potentially a life of cover officers and or civilians getting injured or whatever. And so we take it so seriously that, um, yeah, it's often, and you and I have talked about it, like we'll wake up at four in the morning and be like, what the hell am I going to do with this goddamn dog? <laughs> it's not responding like we thought it was going to, and how are we going to fix it? And uh, I've actually had some of my best epiphanies, you know, during those times. So it's useful for that aspect, but probably not too useful for my health. Uh, <laughs> as I'm not getting that eight hours of, un you know, undisturbed sleep that they're recommending now. No, and I don't think it does a lot for relationship building at home either, right? I mean, there is a point, especially during the class, where – really is all you're thinking about is the next day and what happened today, what can we do to improve the dogs, um, what are we going to, you know, there's a couple dogs that are outliers always, you know, there's, it's never the cookie cutter program where, oh yeah, we're just going to add this and then this is going to come out at the end. There's always some dog that throws a little wrinch in it. There's a handler mm -hmm. that might throw a wrench in things mm -hmm. and you're right. We're sitting up at night trying to think, all right, like, and you and I have had these conversations at five o'clock in the morning at 11 o'clock at night, trying to brainstorm a solution to a problem. Um, yeah, it, it is difficult, but I'm glad that it is. I think that's what keeps us going in this is the solve the problem solving that comes with every dog really. Oh yeah. When, when you crack that nut and you figure out what's making that specific dog tick, it's like, Yes. It's like, that's kind of our heroin, right? Like, it's like, man, that's awesome. Like we figured him out and now he's doing what we wanted him to do. And we did it, you know, in a fair way that was fair to the dog. And, uh, there's definitely a high there, you know, and it's, 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 uh, I think it's what keeps you and I in the business. Yeah, and, there, and obviously there's others like us. Uh, speaking of that, you're getting ready to head out to uh, hold the line, the conference out there in Myrtle Beach. And there's some really good trainers that are going to be out there. You're going to be uh, instructing at hold the line. And then we're going to bring, if we can figure this out, because God knows we're not the most technical guys in the world, but we're going to bring recording equipment out there and we're going to try and grab some of those high level trainers that are out there that are teaching some really cool shit, bring them in and chat with them one on one while we're out there in Myrtle Beach. So that's exciting. Yeah, a lot of familiar names that you guys already know if you're listening to this podcast. I'm sure you listen to others, but there'll be Jerry Bradshaw. Looks like he's going to be out there. Stambro is going to be out there. Um, Nesbeth is going to be out there. So it's, it's going to be a, a, a great lineup. Um, and that's coming up April 9th to 11th. And this is the year 2024, if you're listening to this <laughs> in the future. 
<laughs> in the future. What are you teaching? Uh, just so we can, I, I think we're going to get this podcast dropped before that class starts. So what are you yeah, teaching 100%. so the guys know what to look forward to? I'm going to be doing uh, basically canine handler survival, and it encompasses uh, from basic tactics, things that we've done wrong in the past, things that have, have gone wrong in our training, in others' training, um, uh, all the way to, you know, the way you can – um, prepare your handlers for for certain things where you can prepare your dogs for certain things surviving confrontations so it's an all encompassing uh type type 2 hours so if you guys are going to be at the conference stop by give us a shout out uh you can see Rich and I there you can get a picture with Rich um <laughs> That'll be worth that'll be worth a lot of money one day I'm sure oh yeah you're you're infamous uh so <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it looks like it's going to be a great conference, so check it out. Hold the line, K9 Conference. Awesome. Looking forward to that. Uh, got a couple things coming down the line, too. I think we're making some changes on equipment and some things that were uh, recommended, at least to our groups. I can, I'm going to put you on the spot. How many patrol teams are you, as DTAC, instructing right now? I have no idea. Come on, man. Insert awkward Not silence. Even. No, well, it fluctuates <laughs> so much. It's like, I think we're around 33 agencies. Um, if I had to guess, if you count detection dogs, I mean, we're probably in the 80s as far as teams. So we get a lot of hands-on experience. We get a lot of opportunities to make mistakes. We get a lot of opportunities to check out different types of equipment. And um, this was no mistake that we wound up with our, our next sponsor. Uh, we actually found a need for this. We've had some issues with some of our equipment in the past, uh, specifically with harnesses. And um, we went out and said, hey, let's who's putting out the best equipment out there that we can find? And um, it's an old trusted name from that I'm familiar with from in the 90s. Like they've been doing it a <laughs> long time when I got my first VHS cassette in the 90s about how to do bite work training with a bite suit because my my trainer at the time only did sleeve work and so um and i watched it with a guy named uh, Stuart hilliard and it was like amazing it was mind-blowing like channeling the dog and fight you know and then putting him in prey and you know how to get him on the back of the tricep and it was like wow that's awesome uh, anyway so um they went from that to where they are today they've obviously changed they've evolved I've had conversations with Matt over there, um, and I'm talking about Ray Allen Manufacturing. Uh, they have um, one of the best harnesses, I think, in the industry, and uh, it's not by mistake. They continue to respond to their customers. They continue to update equipment, and um, not just harnesses, but a lot of other things. And a uh, matter of fact, uh, Phil the other day was like, hey, he went and tr grabbed a, a sleeve out of one of the handler's uh, cars, and it was an ambidextrous sleeve. So for those of you handlers that are out there that don't understand what that is, you can wear it on the right and the left. Um, and it's funny because I've, I've gone uh, to different uh, demos and stuff where I see a handler wearing a left-handed sleeve on the right hand, and it's like that might not end up too well, right? Because there's a little opening, and the dog comes in, the grip is all effed up, and, you know, it's like it's, it's dangerous. Um, but they take that, that uh, guesswork out of it for you if you're not sure, and they just give you one that fits both. And so their equipment's awesome. So we're really happy to have them aboard. Yeah, and uh, speaking of sponsors, we continue to be sponsored by Anookshook, and we are extremely happy with the experience we have with them. Uh, they've been with us from the beginning now, and we are using them uh, with our own dogs. So those of you that aren't familiar with Anookshook, Anookshook is designed and manufactured specifically for dogs that do work, and I think that's the important part. It, uh, they actually started off with sled dog teams and mm -hmm. god knows that those dogs work their ass off and their diet requirements are high um, right now they have five different formulas and we at the training center get dozens of new dogs every month that come in the door uh, whether it's pet dogs or police dogs and when a dog is struggling to maintain weight or is looking uh, like they're low on energy or they won't take food by hand, our answer to all those questions is go to a Nookshook. And if it's a really picky dog, then we go to a Nookshook Marine because uh, I have yet to meet a dog that'll say no to the Marine. It's a, it's a fish-based product. Dolphin. And the dogs, 
<laughs> yeah, no dolphin. No, no dolphin. dolphin in a nook, no dolphin in a nook shook. But the dogs no. love it, and we use it um, as treats. It's so valuable to the dogs that we're able to use it as treats. And then there's mm-hmm. some dogs, actually, um, Amy from AIM Canine is down here, and she's got her 10 puppies and six adults, and they have a 14-year-old Malinois here that can Damn. really only survive either on raw or 32-32, which is 32 protein, 32 fat, and that dog thrives. And when you're traveling and you're a country away from home, having a, you know, having a dog that'll be able to function when they're away from home, different weather, different temperature, all that stuff is important. So a Nookshook has been the answer to all those problems, and they're not just a sponsor. It's what we feed our dogs. So What do you, what do you recommend to the run-of-the-mill run police dog? What, what formula? The, 3025 uh, 30, seems 25. to be the, yeah, I know there's a lot of folks out there that are using 3232. We just don't see a need for it. The food is so high quality at the regular level uh, that it works. It works out great. And I, I think the best side of it, and it's kind of a, you know, they they have some stickers with some dogs pooping on it, but it's it's funny and it's cool all at the same time that you get less shit when you feed a nookshook and that's kind of a cool yeah. deal like it's i don't want to be cleaning up a four pound pile of crap because i gave my dog a pile of old roy to eat in the morning and later on in the day it's the same amount comes out that goes in um it's not that way with a nookshook you get small poops which means they're using more of it in their body so less in stuff. less out less in less out well yeah, exactly, and and high quality, and they're keeping weight on. You've seen it now enough with the dogs and the groups, and we have several groups now that are only feeding an shook. So obviously, uh, the guys and gals that are you know handlers in your groups are seeing the value of it as well. Awesome. What are we talking about today, Rich? So today we're talking about myths and legends. We put this out on the LEO page, and we talked to some of the uh, the guys and gals in our groups, and there seems to be. A fair amount of uh, always and nevers out there that nobody really knows where some of them came from. And I think you and I talked about this when we started going down the path of some of these myths and legends. It seems like most of them were born from a real life problem and the solution was probably made by a trainer somewhere or an old school handler that said, hey, fucking quit doing this. Don't ever do it again. You're not allowed to do it again. And then three generations later, it's still being carried on as an always or never. And guys don't really know why uh, that rule is in place, but they know we don't ever do this or we always do that. And we're going to try and break down some of those myths and legends. And we'll start with (laughs) one of our favorites. Um, If you use food and training, your dog won't work when food is around. What do you Mm. think about that? I think Stan Bro covered this. Um, I'm not going to use his terminology <laughs> when we talk no, with let's him. Stay away from that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously a falsehood. Uh, we start all of our young dogs, and Rich, you start most of our young dogs, um, and Phil Phil Ryder has been been supplying us dogs as well. And when you guys get dogs, it's the go-to. I, and I did a little that little video series. And I know I've tried to upload it onto this platform. I cannot figure it out for the freaking life of me. It's on my Instagram, DTAC Canine, uh, where I, the first the first introduction in the first week, man, that's all I'm using with a new dog. You know, you, you, you want to get out there and get in a fight right right out of the gate over a toy or a ball or a tug or whatever. No need. Go go right to food. You get so many more reps with food. Um, it's 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 a staple in our in our dog training and in our relationship building as well. Yeah, and I think I mean I guess we can just boil it down to this: whether you're training your dog with food or not training your dog with food, your dog is eating, right? You feed your dog. So does that mean because your dog eats at eight o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday that at noon when you're doing a vehicle search that it's automatically out there looking for food? It's it's a silly argument. And I'm guessing probably where that one came from. And we're going to maybe try and boil down the foundation of all these myths. That probably came from a dog that went out in a search and ate a hamburger off somebody's counter or, you know, grabbed a candy bar out of somebody's center console. That's separate from you training your dog. If your dog is, you know, searching or doing some task uh, on the job and it goes to eat food, then correct that behavior. Like that behavior is not allowed while you're at work and that's... You know, it is allowed when you're training, and the dog's smart enough to figure that out. Yep, 
and two things. Number one, don't overcomplicate your searches, handlers. Like if you are doing detection, do a sweep and pick up the food. Don't think your dog's going to sniff a hamburger and move on looking for your target odor, right? Why you put him in that position? You hand search that stuff. If there's dog food in the search area, just remove it. Make your life simple. And the other thing is if you're searching for the man and your dog stops and starts taking a lunch break, then we need to look at the type of dog we're using. If he would rather stop and eat, um, you know, obviously maybe we have some issues on priority or like Rich said, then make it a training issue. Um, and that's where the last episode where we talked with Stanbro on the tone, um, we've had some success with that. Um, you know, it's, um, it's one of those things where I think, um, like you said, Rich, I think it was kind of overblown in the beginning, but we definitely use food. It, it is a staple in our training. So, and you guys are going to see in these, in these myths, um, some of them actually have some foundational truth and some of them there's like, well, it, I could see for certain dogs, it could be a possible thing. Um, you know, there's not absolutes, but, um, for sure that's one that we can debunk. Absolutely. Let's move on to the next one. And this one's a little, this is another one that is uh, kind of a case by case basis, but there is mm -hmm. a theory out there that your dog must be in a kennel 24 seven to be a working dog. And then on the opposite side of that is your dog's more than capable of being a working dog. If they come in the house and they live like a pet and they hang around with your kids and they sleep on the couch. I think both of those can be right at certain times and both of those can be wrong at certain times so i guess the the myth is does your dog have to be in a kennel to be able to function uh what's your thoughts on that i think a lot of this came back came, comes from the olden days uh when uh we were dealing with less drive in a lot of our dogs and so there was this perception that you had to kennel or crate the dog when he wasn't working so he would come out with the amount of energy he needed to do the work and their thought was, well, if you're spoiling at home, he's not going to want to go out and, and actually work for a living. Um, kind of like a, a government welfare dog, you know, <laughs> like one that's, that's on Biden's freaking payroll. <laughs> and so, um, you know, but the reality is if you chose the right dog, it really doesn't matter what he's doing on the time off because when the time is to go, he has more than enough energy to do the job. Uh, but we have actually been seeing this reversal of handlers wanting to rush it and have the dog loose and laying around and being on the couch right out of the gate. And um, that's been causing a few problems. And really, it, it's, it's not um, most of the time it's not for lack of a drive, but it's creating some conflict in the, in the house and conflict with the handler and uh, sometimes putting their family a little bit at, at um, in danger unnecessarily. So um, my rule of thumb is the dog. If you want, I, I understand companionship is a. If you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs for people, you know how we have food and shelter and things like that. I believe companionship for a dog is right there with food. Like they are a pack animal. They're from wolves. Wolves had constant companionship. There's a reason why they are in packs. Um, and so what we recommend to handlers is you can bring them in and put them in a crate somewhere where they can be near the family, but not running around the house freely. And I love doing this with a new dog. It comes in the house, goes right in the crate. Every time it comes in my house, it learns it's downtime. Now I can watch the dog in the crate. Kids are running by. Other dogs are walking around. Other things are going on. Is he going in the drive on these things? If he is, done. Outside for the rest of his life in a, in a kennel. I'm not going to risk my family. Uh, however, I'm already setting the foundation. So six months from now, if I decide to have my dog integrated a little bit more into my house, and if I have young children, the dog is never left alone, never running around free. But if I decide with my wife and I that the dog is going to have some freedom, I've already set that foundation that, hey, you come in the house, it's downtime. And then even when they are in the house, then I'm structured. I never leave my dog unattended. I never leave him by himself with anybody in my family. Yeah, and I think is what that boils down to is there's a happy medium, right? Have some common sense. If your dog's going to be inside, it's not the same as your, you know, lab that gets to hang around in front of the fireplace. And, you know, that's not going to cause any damage or hurt anybody. Your dog, and I think Ted says this all the time, don't be surprised if your dog bites somebody because essentially that's what you bought them for, right? So if you are uh, if you have a dog that's in the house and it's been trained to bite people, Use some common sense and don't let it rule the roost. And I think we can both agree that if your dog is unproven on the streets, maybe that's a dog that needs a little more confinement mm -hmm. until I know what they're going to do. Sure. We've seen dogs that uh, work for slower agencies that they might not get a bite opportunity for two or three years in. And 
up until that time, it's been a pet. And now the door pops. And it's like, go bite that guy, you know, or go bite that guy now that's laying passive under a bunch of leaves. And you're asking the dog to make a, a pretty big transition uh, from, from pet to working dog all of a sudden. So, um, so yeah, that, that one, uh, it's, it's one of those again, and you're going to see a lot of these. And I think you're going to find that these aren't just, you know, blanket statements, but there's some truth in, in, in there for sure. Absolutely. Moving on to the next one. And this one's kind of a funny one because I don't think everybody knows really what they're looking at sometimes, but the myth is high energy equals mm -hmm. high drive. And I mean, I, for us, it's easy to boil down because in the pet world at the, at the training center, we see high energy all day, every day, definitely a whole bunch of dogs that cannot do police canine work, but are spun out of their minds. Uh, got a great little chihuahua right now that loves to run around, chase his tail, bark at things, uh, has no ability to do anything that looks like work, can't even slow down to focus on using its nose to find its food sometimes, right? So high energy definitely does not equal high drive, but some vendors out there have found a way, it's not hard to do, to make high energy look mm -hmm. like a dog that has high drive and i'm sure you've seen it and you know we talk about yeah. it all the time sometimes a dog at the end of a leash that's spinning around barking jumping acting crazy looks good to the untrained eye but may not necessarily equally working dog well i'll throw myself under the bus i just made that mistake uh, on testing a detection dog um a lab that was in the backyard for the last two years. And, and um, I, one of, another handler found him was like, Hey, and the dog actually came from really good hunting lines. Um, super social, super energetic. And I was taking a tennis ball, throwing it. He would he appeared to be looking for that tennis ball for, for three minutes would jump, would kill himself for it. And once we got him out of that environment and actually got him into training, um, his hunt, was uh, apparently not where we thought it was. And so, but his drive, and he's like a pain in his dog to live with, like he will drive you crazy and he will demand the ball and he will sit there and play fetch for hours. Um, but when it came down to it, his hunt was not as high as, as his energy level. So, or, or his prey drive or the drive to interact with the toy. So, um, yeah, so even this far into it, right, it's, it's sometimes hard to differentiate when you're out there testing, but it's definitely something to be aware of. One does not equate to the other for sure absolutely <laughs> number four and i think we talked about this a little bit with stanbro also and uh, again we'll use less of his terms and more of uh the california side of things um toys and toy use with your dog makes you less of a man we'll say uh less of a handler i nobody i think has any question with you and i what we feel about this uh toy play with a dog not only is acceptable, but in our world is imperative. It's mandatory. And a um, matter of fact, in the handler class, that's, that's, we spend a lot of time teaching guys and gals to be able to get excited and actually interact with your dog because you can't phone it in. You can't just be like, ah, good dog, or toss the toy and freaking hits them in the head and they pick it up. Like, it ain't worth anything unless you're attached to it and you're making it fun. And uh, that's an art in of itself. But really, handlers out there, you can't fake it. Like, enjoy it. You're interacting with this animal. Like, have fun with it. And um, you'll see the dog just rising. And now that helps relationship. We can work positive reinforcement and within operant conditioning and reward them for behaviors. And if you get a dog that you can reward a behavior and make them want to do it, it's just a much solid, more solid behavior and a much happier dog. And honestly, it makes the whole process so much more fun. Yeah, I think we talk about it all the time uh, on the pet side of things, not to mention the police dog side of things. But w this is hard work for some of these dogs. We're asking them to do some things that aren't necessarily uh, genetically designed for the dog, right? Like some of the stuff that we want them to do is out of their comfort zone. The thing that bridges some of those behaviors is their excitement to do it and be able to interact with you. If you teach a dog to really enjoy biting the decoy, sometimes in the beginning when we're forming these behaviors, the only thing that makes them want to let go is the promise of playing with you. And then later on, we can get rid of the toy and we can just do it because there's an expectation there. But I can get my dog to sit for some food. I can get my dog to lay down for some food. I can get my dog to come to me for some food but I can get them to do it a hell of a lot more excitedly and fast um, 
and motivated when I bring a toy into the game. And, and like you said, I, it's mandatory. I don't even, I can't remember now. I mean, we look back and I remember when we weren't allowed to use toys for training and how god awful miserable that was to get a dog to do a behavior. And I mean, we talk about it all the time. We probably owe all of our past dogs uh, a big apology because the shit that we were making them do and not providing them really any fun for it. Um, it's, it's pretty unfortunate. You know, we talked to Brett. Brett's trained with me for a long time, and he's like, man, <laughs> when I get to wherever I'm going, I got to meet up with my old dogs and tell them all I'm sorry because I, I gave them hell for decades and, you know, wasn't able to reward them. Yep, 100%. Moving on to the next one. And this, one's, uh, this one still is uh, pretty pervasive. Obedience kills drive, and this is big in the – detection dog world and i know you're kind of knee deep and working a lot of detection dogs right now that are only single purpose detection dogs and i think this is another one that's born from some fact right like if you get too heavy on the obedience side there might be some truth to this myth so tell me what you think about uh, that that case sure um I'll, I'll talk about both extremes if i've got a handler that comes out with a eod dog and the dog's in like this perfect heel and then it has like a focused heel and then downs and is like, bam, like locked down and then, and then has a sit and, and the guy's working change of positions and recalls. We, we've got a problem because uh, the, the, old, the theory is actually, and it's not wrong, is with a detection dog, I mainly want them to be obedient to odor and not necessarily as obedient to the handler. So the handler, they start to feel leash pressure, or the handler's trying to pull them a certain way, and you want the dog to go, no, I've got odor, I'm going to pull you, and I'm going to ignore your your uh, your command or your suggestion uh, while you're presenting. So I think that's where it was born from. And then also, Rich, you, hit, you, you, know, you talked earlier about um, we were, as an industry, we were very compulsive in the way we trained. So you would add, you, you come out and some of these dogs are very sensitive and now we're overlaying corrections and we're, we've got them on a pinch collar and now we start to hurt, we start to get them to question themselves when it comes to venturing out and searching. So that was one end of the spectrum and I think a lot of that's where that was born. But then, you know, the other end of the spectrum is you have a dog, a police dog that has no recall. Um, that's problematic, right? This dog gets out and he takes off or you're searching offline and he decides he wants to do something else. Um, that makes me nervous. Um, also, just as if handling a dog, sometimes I want to put my dog in a down and do something in the environment and then come back to him without having to go, hey, can somebody hold my dog or tie him up or something like that? The other thing we've seen is or some of these dogs are so driven that they, they're pulling to the search area, pulling, 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 and they get there and like, <sighs> Right. They're like exhausted because they just pulled the handler halfway across the parking lot to get to the search area. I don't want that either. So um, and then you look at the fact of how many detection dogs are also patrol dogs and how much control do we have on patrol dogs? You know, I, I ran a dog that took, uh, I think, second in Western states in detection and he was a great patrol dog. And so to say that you can't have control, just it blows that myth up. I think really it's absolutely you need control. You need to be careful how you put that control in there. You need to really consider, I still want obedience to odor, but I don't want a dog with no obedience uh, at all to um, to be running with a handler. I just, that you know, we always say you need to teach the things that are going to potentially kill a dog. And with no recall or no obedience at all, it's, it's problematic. And I think some of that you can you can temper by the way you use your equipment, right? Like you can make your equipment very clear to the dog what time it is and what they're doing. And we still see it with even patrol dogs where dogs on a prong or, you know, a slip or something like that. And the handler is allowing the dog to pull them on that uh, corrective device into a search scenario. So the dog's all pumped up. The dog's at the end of the leash. It's pulling and it's on a prong collar you're not really giving your dog a fair understanding of what you want because the next time you're going to be walking down the street and the dog's going to be pulling on the prong and you're going to be like, hey, buddy, like quit pulling on the prong. Why are you doing this? Well, you just let me do that yesterday. I pulled you into the search with the prong collar. So my thought is, is make your equipment clear to your dog what they're supposed to do on it. If you have a dog on the prong collar, then it should be loose. It should be not. It should have the understanding that, hey, we don't pull when we're on this. 
but you flip me over to the flat collar or the harness, now it's time to get after it. And if you kind of set those parameters for your dog, then your dog should understand in pretty quick order, when I'm on this, we get to go out and find shit. When I'm on this thing, I should probably be a little more of a gentleman when I'm walking next to you. Yep, I agree. Makes, th- makes things clear. Uh, that that kind of hits our next one, which uh, me we were going into that detection dogs can't have obedience. And I think you answered that. And I think like we talked about, there's a middle ground there. Your detection dog should not be, does not need to do any kind of high level trial obedience. But man, if your dog gets off leash, you should be able to call him back. And I think for the sake of living with a dog, it'd be nice if your dog had a place command or down or something where like, you know, Kylie just <clears throat> sold that little cocker spaniel mm-hmm. who's a tornado. I don't want that fucking thing living in my house, spinning circles all around. You know, hey, if you're coming inside, lay over there and chill out. When it's time to go out and search, then we can open that can and do that away from here. So, again, like everything so far, there's some middle ground. And when we go into always and nevers, there's there's problems. Yep, I agree. So this one, this will be a fun one for you. And uh, this is uh, almost a dirty word now. Um, You have to be the alpha with your dog. Yeah, and, I, you know, the actual, the whole term alpha uh, came from a guy named Mech in the early 90s, and he did wolf research. And um, he later says he really regretted using that terminology as wolves actually in the wild. Uh, they're mainly families. And so there isn't this, like, dominant struggle thing that um, I think is implanted into handlers' minds uh, from trainer, trainers years ago that you have to be this – like stern, I'm going to show this dog that he is the beta. Uh, he's a beta male, and I'm the alpha male. And um, but you know, having said that, like relationship is really important, and we talk about that. Like I'm not, you know, and some of these guys are bringing dogs into the house, and they don't have that proper relationship. The dog jumps up on the couch, and he's like, "Get off of there!" And now we have a fight, right? So um, I I do believe in pack structure. I think the relationship is that the dog should understand that you are the boss. Um, that you're calling the shots. However, I don't like using this term alpha uh, because I think it, there's that, that perception of like, okay, I need to roll with an iron fist. And we found actually later in wolf studies, and that was part of mech studies, that actually the wolves, they, they worked together as a family unit and they worked um, in, in harmony because why waste time fighting within the pack? You're, you're draining your, your resources. You need to learn to work together because getting goal, the goal is to get food for the pack and pack survival. So, um, that whole term, when I hear somebody say, well, I got to be the alpha, I immediately think, okay, you're going to be that, that person that's just going to be micromanaging, nitpicking and doing things to the dog just to show that you are the boss. And, um, and some, some of these dogs are you're going to find counter control in that that solution, and you're going to have dogs coming up the line, or you're going to be squashing dogs. So, um, I, and I know it's 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 one of those things where it, you know for a new handler it might be difficult to understand. Well, I'm supposed to have a good relationship, but um, just just the the key is be fair. You know, like in the beginning we're a Pez dispenser, but then holding the dog accountable. If I give the dog a command, I'm going to reinforce it. But it's very business like. It's not emotional. The only time I'm emotional is when I'm rewarding and playing with the dog. Other than that, it's 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 you know my commands are very low low tone because we'll see this too in the handlers. Right, we're like, fooey fooey, plots plots plots. You know, I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, say it once, make it happen, keep it business like, keep your emotions out of it. Um, you're creating this this confrontation with the dog that doesn't need to be there. Yeah, I think it boils down to leadership, right? Like, when I guess we could replace the word alpha with be a leader. Mm-hmm. And hopefully, if you've worked for a good leader, or if you've been parented by a good leader, you have a good understanding of what that means. And maybe if you've been. You've been employed by a bad leader or you've been parented by a bad leader. You also understand what that means. And I think, um, I think Stambro, uh, on the pet side of things, they have a thing that says, be a leader, not a litter mate. And I think that's really what we're looking for is the dogs and what you're talking about with the wolves. Somebody is leading the pack, but you're right. They're not out there kicking each other's ass every day because there's no need for that. And how much trust are you going to get from your dog if every day you're out there 
alpha rolling or pinning your dog on the ground or for God's sakes, making your dog go unconscious so that when it wakes up, it understands what the rules are. All these archaic mindset of what alpha was. Let's just replace that with be a leader and give them strong leadership with clear communication and be fair with your dog. And I think you'll find out that there's not a need for the alpha process. There's just a need for your leadership and the dog to understand that my job is to follow you. I think, Agreed. That's, I think that's fair. Moving on to <laughs> my dog can beat up all the other dogs because I have this badass Malinois or this badass shepherd. And if I go to a call and there's a dog in the backyard, that dog better watch out because my dog is a badass. hundred percent the opposite, right? Cause, and this is what we, we, we teach our dogs not to worry about other dogs and we do group obedience. We do muzzle obedience where they're within a foot of each other. You know, don't worry about that other dog. And now we're out on a search and here comes another dog and our dog's like, Hey, what's up? I'm, I'm searching. <laughs> Wham. <laughs> they're at a strong disadvantage um you know so and i always told my shift um when we, whenever we went 10-8 it's like hey um our dog is responsible for finding and potentially protecting us from suspects right to a certain degree we are responsible if there's a dog that comes up that we are to protect the canine from the dog and that's my job. And then more specifically, if we encounter another dog that looks like it's going to be aggressive or I don't even care if it looks like it's coming towards the dog, I pull back, cover steps in front, and then we have to deal with that dog because my dog is generally not going to be equipped to handle himself in that situation. And there are dogs that are specifically bred for dog fighting. And, um, and it's just one of those things that once they've locked, and this is a whole separate podcast, now what are we going to do? Now you got to break up a dog fight, and now is everybody staying focused on the mission? We still have a suspect out there. It's, it's, it's all bad. And then on the flip side of that, see you get a dog, and your dog becomes really good at dog fighting. Well, now you have a big fucking problem. Now every backyard they go into, they're looking for a fight. You think your dog's going to focus on a search if now they've become this really, really good dog fighter? God forbid. I mean, and like you said, some dogs are bred for fighting, and most of those dogs are the dogs we're going to find in, not to generalize, but we're going to find the, that breed of dogs in a lot of shitty neighborhoods. It's not rare to find one or several pit bulls in the backyard of a house that you're going to do work at. Um, and those dogs are looking for a fight, and genetically they're pretty, pretty damn good at it. Your dog has been taught over the last several years to not look for a fight. Matter of fact, you've probably corrected them several times when they growled at another dog. Sure. And I fucked another dog. Like, we've stopped that behavior. So, like you said, we put our dog at a disadvantage. And I don't want my dog to be good at fighting other dogs. That's silly. Agreed. All searches should be done on leash. And then we can flip that and say all searches should be done off leash. Yeah, and I'm seeing more. Uh, and oh man, this goes hand in hand with another another one. I don't think we even have on our list. Um, with with um, uh, every trainer should be a, a police dog, previous police dog handler, right? Law enforcement guy. Um, I'll, I'll tackle this one first, though, with the, with the leash. Um, depending on the mission, I search offline if I can. However. Being a realist and having searched in, an, in, a, in a city um, that was populated, um, I, I don't search offline in a neighborhood um, or in a city environment or where there could potentially be a transient or there could potentially be a civilian. Um, I put my dog online. And if you're doing tracking, um, your dog should probably be online for tracking. Can we agree on that? Unless your, your dog <laughs> is tracking offline, which... Man, I want to see it. That's good. Good for you. Uh, I mean, truly, you know, trailing. Um, so we want to have that dog typically online. So, um, yeah, so that's that's obviously false. Um, and it, um, again, if I can have my dog offline, if it's a big enough environment, if I'm working in the county, if I've got a fenced-in area, if I know there should be nobody else but the suspect in that area, boom, offline all day long. Um, I like doing our tactical building searches offline as long as you have a really good down. I know that we're having worked with the SWAT team, they hate a long line coming around their legs um, and they have to step over it. And it kind of is one more thing they have to be aware of and potentially get wrapped up on things. So um, if you have the control, which um, we do, we go offline on our building searches 100%, especially in a tactical environment. However, there are times where we want to be online. Um, we had a situation where there was a back slider open. They knew it was open in an apartment, and they wanted to send the dog in and clear that room with the slider open. 
and we go, hey, let's put him online just to make sure he doesn't go out that slider and jump off the balcony. Okay, makes sense, right? Um, so, um, so yeah, so the, the answer there is it depends, and it depends on what your mission is and your environment and what you're searching. We're about three-quarters of the way through the list, and I think is what the theme that is developing is there's never – Man, almost never and always and a never. When you have somebody telling you always do your work offline or always do your work online, I would be suspicious of everything that comes after that because mm -hmm. I think you just pointed out several scenarios where you can't have always and nevers. And when you get into that world, things start to get dangerous because if you tell this young handler, never put your dog on a long line, everything can be handled by e-collar, shit fails. Batteries go dead. Toggles get moved. Uh, you're a young handler. You may not have the timing and the skill that you would have if you've been doing this for decades. Um, it's like you said, it's it's different in every scenario. And I know we have a lot, but we don't have a run on the market on homeless and transients. And there's not many buildings out here where you go around the blind corner and somebody's not camping behind that building. That has nothing to do with the crime that you're investigating so uh it gets dangerous and i don't really want to be responsible for paying a big ass check out to some transient because i was adamant that i wasn't using a line to clear a blind corner so. hey rich let me put you on the spot because i don't think this is on the list but it this question led me down this path um should civilians somebody that's never worked a police dog be a police dog or a canine handler trainer I guess my answer to that, and I know we've talked about it in the past and you are putting me on the spot and I don't, I mean, I'm thinking across this broad spectrum and there are some really, really good dog trainers out there that don't have the experience that a police handler has. And some of that comes down to case law. Some of it comes down to really good understanding of how to interpret policies for agencies. Some of it comes down to your experience on the street and the mistakes that you've had, the mistakes that you've seen and the work that you've done. I think if you are a trainer and you've never handled a dog in a, as a police officer, you should be working with somebody who has. I think there is some value. Phil's a good example of this. Phil is an excellent dog trainer. Phil is an excellent decoy. Without us being there to help guide him on what things are allowed in police work, how things operate, what it's like working with a SWAT team, what it's like working with hostage negotiation, now drones, all those things. Phil hasn't had that experience, so he doesn't have that to draw from. So we can take his experience as a dog trainer, which admittedly is better than mine, and use our experience uh, as street cops working canines and provide a full experience to the handlers that are learning from us. But I don't think it's fair for young, for new handlers, for handlers in general to be trained by somebody who doesn't understand how the job works. So yeah, I and guess I'll, long and answer. Yeah, no, that, that, that was a good no. answer. Um, and I'll say this. So I started out with a, in, in the nineties, uh, with a civilian trainer and, um, I, didn't know what I didn't know. And I would always, I'd hear that and I'd be like, bullshit, you know, we freaking, we know what we're doing. We got these exercises we run. These dogs are fucking good. They don't know what they're talking about. You know, it's in grouping, you know, cops just don't want to da 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 da. And then, um, and then I became a cop and I saw all the holes in what we were doing. And I'll say this, if you are training with a, I don't have an issue with a civilian dog trainer and i learned most of my my best dog training theories and concepts and techniques come from the civilian world um, I had a PSA club and I learned a tremendous amount uh, in the sport world that I was able to apply to dog training in the police world however if you are have never done the job I'm telling you there's a lot of theories out there and we've seen it recently where we we got a contract that was trained by civilians and they had theories that were not practical because they've never been in that situation. And until you've actually deployed a dog with a SWAT team, you know, you can listen to others talk about it. But there are so many friggin' pitfalls that can occur um, that I think saying that, you know, um, you know, being in that position where you've never been there, it, it's 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 um, there's just so many nuances that are lost. Now, I'll say this. I think the model can work 100 percent. 
if it's a civilian trainer that can also have another trainer that works with them that has law enforcement experience and specifically canine experience and can offset that short that you know that that shortfall so it's like okay you've got the dog training like you said rich a lot of the best trainers out there most of them are all civilian type trainers and then um, you have the expertise of somebody that's been there and can go, I understand in theory what you're saying, but in practicality, this is why it doesn't work. And they work hand in hand. And I, I've, I've met some really good civilian dog trainers that, that do that, and they rely on the handlers and the experience from others that are in law enforcement. And then I think it, I think it works out just fine. Yeah, and I guess that'll take us to the next myth. Uh, handlers can automatically become trainers. Yeah, because you've you've worked on one dog, um, I mean, we are still learning, and uh, I've probably touched over a thousand police dogs in my career, and I'm still coming up and learning things and coming into different situations, but I have that to draw from, and we are seeing this more and more. If you guys have a mandatory rotation when it comes to canine, and you can only work one or two dogs, and then you're out, um, and then you have new handlers and new dogs coming in there. Um, it's problematic, especially if you are not outside of your group working with a trainer. You are going to repeat the same mistakes over and over and over again. Um, so I, I think that one is actually uh, that that's that's that that's that one's actually right on. Now we do have uh, we have current handlers that are that are working with us. You know, um, Jason Miller. Uh, just to, to, to throw one out there that it's, it's still a handler um, and, and he's working for you too, Rich, and he's, st he's a yeah. trainer as well. So I, I can't, I'm not going to say just because you're a handler, you can't be a dog trainer or, or the, the unit trainer, but it takes a special person to be able to do that. And I think if that's the model that, Hey, the senior handler is always the trainer. I think you guys are going to run into some problems. I think it's like pet dogs. Do you can, you can get away with being pretty good when there's not a problem. It's when the problems start to develop and then you have to reach into your bag of, of tricks and skills and techniques that you've used on these other problems in the past. And you have the lack of ego to allow yourself to allow other information into your training program to be a problem solver. It's when you close the gate or you just haven't had enough experience that it becomes a problem when you're dealing with dogs that aren't run of the mill or you're dealing with handlers and their dogs that aren't a run of the mill problem. So yeah, I guess you can get away with it until there's something that's bigger than what you're used to. And then th that experience is absolutely necessary. And you and I deal with this all the time. I'm in my fifties, you're in your fifties. We've been doing this for a long time and we never stop learning and getting information from other trainers that are out there doing that and we've been through a lot of dogs and we continue to be through a lot of dogs and the answer is still show me let's see if it works and if it works then we're like shit we'll open the door for for that training technique maybe just for this dog maybe as a blanket uh, experience for all dogs but um, we have so much experience to draw from that we can see pretty quickly if it's something that's going to benefit the program I agree uh, moving forward, uh, let's just talk about breeds in general. Those, what I have on here is mouths can't track, but there's also mouths aren't first dog or first handler dogs. Uh, my agency should only use German shepherds. Um, Dutch shepherds are crazy. Can we just talk about working dogs in general? And as you put it, getting caught up in the paint job. Yeah. I mean, we have examples and we'll, you know, there's certain traits that are automatically attributed to the mouth, right? He spun up, he spins, he's just uh, crazy over the top prey drive, isn't methodical. And, you know, some of that, some of that reputation is earned because, <laughs> you know, their energy level is high. Um, however, you can't judge the, do the dog by the paint job. I mean, we've got dogs that are calm as fuck in their mouths and they track like freaking machines. Um, and then we have shepherds that are spun up and are just like I described earlier when I was talking about the stereotypical mouth. So really it's individual, uh, just like people, you can't judge them by the cover. So, um, you know, whenever there's a policy and I, I, we get this sometimes, right. Where the, they're like chief says absolutely no mouths. I'm like, all right, we just reduced our, our stock of looking at dogs by like 60, 70%. And so, um, 
it's one of those things where it's it's completely false. And as you know, with your friends up in Canada, AIM K9, um, I mean, they produce like some really nice tracking dogs and they're all Malinois guys. So, yeah. um, so open up, open up your mind. I guess it's easy just to go, I don't want this. And what it tells me when they say we don't want a Mal, um, it, it just tells me, okay, I have an idea of what you are stereotyping as a Mal. And I understand that's the type of dog you don't want. However, um, usually, honestly, we, we get a good mouth and then we say, hey, bring your admin out. And they meet the dog and they're like, okay, that's a pretty nice dog. And we're like, yeah. I think one thing to keep in mind if you're an agency and you're looking for a dog and you're one of those no mal agencies in the 80s and 90s when the mouths first started showing up, most of the trainers that were working with dogs and handlers that were working with dogs at that time were working with, with shepherds. When the mouths came, a lot of those people treated mouths like they treated their shepherds. Mouths are, on a whole, I would say significantly more uh, fragile, um, sensitive, uh, not fragile that you're maybe going to break them, but their mindset is very sensitive to the handler's input. So if you were used to being relatively heavy handed with a shepherd and then you got a young Mal and you use that heavy handed approach, the Mal might be more likely one to quit because they're like, whoa, sorry, I didn't know we were getting into this. Or a strong Mal would say, hey, you can fuck right off and they'd come up the leash. And then people were like, hey, these things are crazy. We learned definitely over the last several decades to have a different approach with Malinois and training has moved to a point where um, I think it's just boiled down to find the dog that's best for your unit uh, and don't get wrapped up in the paint job. Yep. Agreed. Uh, moving on to e-collars and we can throw breaker bars into this uh, as well, but e-collars should only be used as a last resort. And I think when people are talking about that is what they mean is uh, the e-collar shouldn't be something you rely on to communicate with your dog. It's just there to make your dog come back to you or to let go of something. Yeah, uh, it, it tells me when when I hear that I'm like, okay, they're using it improperly and they're using it as a hammer, and um, you know they're they're putting it on the dog as a last resort and they have not integrated that into their training program, and uh, they're probably as as Stanbro would say, uh, you know, they're still using choke chains and throw chains and and that type of thing with the dog because the industry has progressed and you can have control a uh, hundred yards away and be able to talk to that dog and do it properly. And if you, if you introduce the e-collar properly, it's not inhumane and it is one of your best tools on your belt. So I don't go, I think we've talked about it before. Like none of our dogs go 10, eight without an e-collar. Like, why would we, we introduce it in the basic. We start overlaying it early on. Uh, we use, we hold the remote. And then once the handler has an understanding of the concept, then we hand that remote off to them, usually like week four, and then we monitor it. So uh, it can be one of the best tools. It can be one of the worst tools. It depends on how it's used. Uh, we can apply that to tools in general, right? The prong collar can be a great tool. It can be a bad tool. A flat collar can be a great tool. It can be a bad tool. I mean, there's so many things that if you misuse something that's on your dog, you can have a negative result from that. Uh, I think, again, where this came from is when e-callers first came out, there was an on switch and an off switch, and yep. there wasn't a whole lot of dial it to the number that you need. It was it was a hammer, and it was I think it was produced at that time only to be a hammer. Things have changed. Um, we put dogs or we put e-callers on dogs at about five months old. And we start overlaying it at such a low level. And we do this with all of our pet dog owners. We put the e-collar on their arm and I apply the same number that we apply to the pet dogs and ask them if they can feel it. None of the owners that we've dealt with so far, and there's thousands, have ever been able to feel on a e-collar technology anything below a 10. Most of our dogs that are working just basic obedience with overlay of any color are working below the level of 10. So it's not a hammer anymore, it's a way to communicate and it's a very precise way to communicate and it makes your communication with your dog clear if you're doing it right. So um, that is definitely a myth and you should not be using your e-collar as a last resort. If you are, you're using it wrong and you're missing out on the benefits of the e-collar. This last one, and I think this is kind of a no-brainer, but 16 hours a month is plenty to train a police dog. 
Yeah, I, I, and the reality is you're always training your dog, and this is what we try to instill in our, our, our new handlers, is that dog is always learning. So, um, you know, and if you are a new handler, uh, you should have that dog out and be doing something every shift, whether you're doing an article search, whether you're laying a track, whether you're just going out and doing basic obedience. Everybody, you need to take your dog out and give him breaks. Why not make it a, um, a productive session and work something in, in one of those disciplines um, while you do that? Yeah, I think it's, uh, uh, one, it's called a minimum requirement because it's the minimum. You know, there, nobody's out there saying 16 hours is all you need to have a great dog. 16 hours is what you have to reach the bottom, right? That's the bottom, the minimum requirement, the least you can do. Do shit with your dog. And I think most people at this point probably realize you're going to get a better dog when you do more training. Uh, but handlers, just like everybody else in the world, get lazy and they rely on the maintenance training to give the dog what they need. You're never going to get what you need if you're only relying on maintenance training to get it there. Maintenance training is to maintain what you have. If you want your dog to be better, then you have to train on your own time. So, well, the, the, the last yeah. handler class we just had, we always do a what's going to be our slogan for the handler class. And uh, they wanted to go with we all wind up with the dog we deserve. And it was in that vein of like, okay, if you graduate this class and you just show up to training – and that's all you do, then when shit hits the fan and your dog needs to perform, then you have the dog that you deserve at that moment. If you're out there doing all these extra things that we just discussed, then you deserve that dog and um, and the results that come from it. So that's, um, well, that's I got pretty one more. much the lit. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Here's the bonus one. Your dog should never carry a sleeve. <laughs> and the reason this, this one was a hot topic for me in the 90s. Uh, again, shout out to Brian Mowry. He's a, a trainer for the Secret Service. He was. I haven't talked to him in a number of years. Um, but I, I started out with this old German trainer. And, you know, if you're going to use food, you're in trouble. If you're going to use a toy, you're in trouble. And God, forsake, God forbid you never let that dog ever carry a sleeve um, or you've ruined that dog. And um, Obviously, that's not the truth. We get we get dogs from Germany all the time um, that are from Schutzen and those in IPO or um, was it DVG? What are we calling it nowadays? Uh, it's got it's, tra it's transitioned so many times. It's so not IPO um, anymore. anyway, there I show my ignorance. Uh, so uh, <laughs> uh, and those dogs have, have carried sleeves, you know, extensively, right, to improve grips and the drive and everything else like that. And so. Um, and we do it with young dogs, correct, Rich? When you're All when you're time. bringing them All up, we the want time. to build yep. the dog. We we want to work grips, get calmness out of that. They can take something away. You're putting pressure. You can relieve pressure. They can take it, um, have them bring it back, interact with them again, and um, and I'm talking about 90% of the trainers out there. I understand there's some philosophies out there with some young dogs where they never they're, they're working them on the man early on. Um, and I, I'm not going to speak to that because I think the majority of us are getting sport dogs and they're, we're, we're training and kind of in the methods that we're discussing. Um, so my old trainer was really big into never. I met Brian and, um, he's the one that entered, he was a pro trainer for Tritronics. I was fortunate to meet him in the nineties and, um, blew my mind, uh, at that point in time. And, um, he, he said to me, he goes, look, if a dog is going to bite a person, it does not matter if you let this dog carry the sleeve a thousand times. When it comes time to it, he is going to bite a person. Now, the caveat to this is we hit a certain point in the dog's training where we are trying to get them a little bit more civil, a little bit more man-oriented, and I we will stop like carrying sleeves and things like that. And we want to make sure they're clear on the mission, right? Because you can take it too far. Now he's running along. Somebody's waiting for a sleeve to come out. We've made him way focused on the equipment, more so than we want. We've created a problem. We don't want to take him to that point. So there comes a time where we stop slipping sleeves. But if you've got a dog out there that's got a dozen street bites and you're in training and you want to do a sleeve slip, you are not breaking that freaking dog. That doesn't mean he goes out there for bite 13. He's like, well, where's the sleeve? Right. So so it really depends on the dog. But early on, um, we actually do quite a bit of it. We even slip suits. Whoa. I yeah. mean, that's we slip sleeves. <laughs> we slip suits. We do. I mean, we're creating possessiveness. It's not. Like you said, in the beginning, there's a reason for all this. There's a reason that we're doing some of that. And if your dog's four 
and you're still slipping sleeves and suits as a part of their progression, we've gone too far in one direction. And this leads to almost the whole list, I think, outside of some of the e-collar and stuff is that there you have to be careful with the always and the nevers because sometimes there's a time for something and sometimes there's not a time for something. And I think, uh, like we talked about at the beginning, is the reason why this list came up is at some point in a handler's life, a trainer's life, a dog's life, something went wrong over here in this area and the solution was to say, hey, don't fucking ever do that again. And maybe it applied to that dog, maybe the trainer applied it to the whole agency, but then it became an always and a an never and that's a dangerous world to live in most of the time. So, Agreed. common sense. Yep, yep, yep. We're at the one hour. So hope, <laughs> hopefully, this, uh, hopefully this list at least makes you think about some things. Look at your own program. Look and see if there's some myths and some, and some thoughts out there that you have that you're like, hey, why are we doing this? We don't really know what the reason is. It's uh, something that's always been done. Our agency has always done this. Our training group has always done this. Maybe there's a good foundation in it. Maybe it makes perfect sense and you stick with it. But maybe it's something that you can do away with if you have a better understanding of how it got there in the first place. So like most of our podcasts, our goal is to educate and get some some information out there so people can you know move forward in their own way with the you know with all that information together and hopefully this works for that yep so until next time train hard be safe <laughs>